Okay, contraceptive architecture. So Karl Gerasi, this is his name, an Austrian American, um, I don't know what he was, doctor, researcher, whatever. He was the father of the contraceptive pill and he, he died today. I mean, some years ago, but on this day. And this is the reason why I engage in this maybe strange uh, uh, activity now, this, uh, this presentation. But let's read this beautifully uh, humorous and true, I would say, line from the great Portuguese poet, Fernando Pessoa. We need God and aspirins. I love this because it's true, you know, we need the absolute, we need the infinite, we need uh, his majesty, we need nature, we need ideals, but we also need aspirins because it doesn't matter how lofty our, our ideas and our aspirations, we, we are still, you know, trembling human beings on this earth. So we need aspirins. So it's very possible we also need a contraceptive pill because the world is not ideal. Yeah, we'd like to have as many children as possible, but what do you do? I have to go to work. My wife has to go to work. We both have to go to work. And the work uh, is as it is. And what are we going to do with 10 children or with 20 children like Johann Sebastian Bach? This is something totally inconceivable today to have 20 children and also to practice art and also to be Johann Sebastian Bach. So, you know, we are limiting ourselves. A child at the most later in life. I know people who say, um, I met such people, uh, you know, who said, I, I can't afford a child because, um, you know, I, I'm not ready. I, I cannot put money aside for education. So all these uh, fears, essentially it's about fear, you know, uh, but, but it's a justified fear, it's true. But, but what if we let life, you know, okay, we, know, we are not going to use that invention of the, the Austrian doctor um, or whatever he was. Uh, we are not going to use any kind of protective measures. The ones that uh, Rem Kohl has called the, the um, um, paraphernalia of protections. And we just allow, you know, courageously and perhaps also irresponsibly to an extent, life to act through us. If it is for a baby to be born, let the baby be born. If it is to build a wall that is three meters thick of bricks and stones or whatever, let's build it like this. Let's not find, a, a, you know, a, some kind of a replacement, you know, um, 10 times thinner, uh, made in the factory, uh, you know, through dry means, you know, and then so we have time then to rush home and sit on the sofa and watch a soap opera. I, you know, I'm improvising now, but I understand Pessoa and it, it makes me smile with, you know, this, this line it makes me smile. Indeed, we need God and aspirins. Uh, so yes, we need God and we also need, uh, unfortunately, the contraceptive pill. I understand that in architecture, there is a quest for uh, thinness and lightness and, uh, you know, kind of to escape the gravity of gravity. But, but, the, but the result is, uh, I don't know, somehow is, is a lessening of life as opposed to an intensification of life. So uh, I found, uh, you know, searching at random on, on Google images, I found this expression, 10 plus sterile white ideas. Whiteness, on one hand, in my opinion, yes, it could be a symbol of purity, but it could also be, a, a, you know, a symbol of, uh, of paleness, you know, of being uh, lifeless, if not dead. I mean, you know, what is, you know, uh, the tectonics of such a space? You know, it, it, it is intimidating in a way because it's a ghostly space. It is exactly what Zaha in her professed um, ideals didn't, you know, uh, was trying to search for. Rawness, vitality, vit vit vitality and, uh, and earthiness. 
Here we see none of that. It, it, it's a sleek space, uh, rectangular, uh, maybe with a certain degree of refinement, but I don't know. Is it, to, be, to put it bluntly, it is not uh, erotically charged. This is not an erotically charged space. Now you could say, why do I need the eroticism? Well, because Eros is, is fighting Thanatos. Eros is uh, that, that vital manifestation of life that if, if we eliminate even that, what, what do we get? I mean, look at this ridiculous white thing, you know, or what is this? You know, it, it's the definition of sterility. It's, it's ridiculous. The most humble little hut in an African village is much more vital than this thing. In fact, I would say that the so-called primitive architecture is uh, very vital and very raw and very earthy. Exactly the ideals that uh, Zaha Hadid professed she was searching for, but didn't quite achieve. And she didn't quite achieve also perhaps because of objective reasons, because it's perhaps easier to build a little hut in an African village than to build a headquarters of, I don't know, BMW or Mercedes or I don't know what mega, uh, mega structure. And look at this, look at these buildings, you know. I don't know. I mean, yes, they are a little bit above the water, but to me, they are essentially expressions of um, sterility, you know, of. Uh, of actually having nothing to say, really. They are pale, they are um, contrived, they are um, grayish. Uh, I, they don't provoke in me uh, an erotical reaction at all. It's uh, now, uh, uh, you know, again, you say architecture should have other goals than that. Uh, yes, but um, this kind of architecture is, um, you know, it, to me, it's not a, an uplifting sign of life at all. But look at this. Look at this interior. And look at that lady. She looks through the large window all alone. Yes, that bench in wood is maybe made by Snoheta. It does look like a, somehow like a Snoheta rendering. But even here, I see a lot of almost despair. You know, it, it's, it's the solitude of the contemporary human being. Uh, that being that, that controls everything, including the, um, you know, the, the birth of the baby. I mean, there are, it's known now, now that you, you, you know the sex of the baby before the baby was born. Even that surprise we don't have any longer. You know? It's known a priori, it's known. You know, science discovered it. So little by little, everything is controlled and uh, known beforehand. And so there is no mystery, no chance, no, uh, you know, I don't know, to me, this is a frightening prospect where we eliminate, you know, the, 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 the joy in a way of life. Why do we need to know everything in advance? You know, why, why can't we allow life to surprise us? I mean, look at this, you know, well, what is this? It's, what is this? You know, is it a kitchen or something? Or why is it so whitish and, uh, you know, cold? And uh, uh, I repeat, I prefer the humblest, poorest little hut in a bi African village of old than this. Uh, or look at this. Isn't this. Isn't this an image of sterility? It is. I mean, imagine having a so-called round table in such a room, which is not round. You know, <laughs> how much imagination could you have? How much fantasy could you have? You know, everything is sleek and yes, it's comfortable. Yes, it's controlled. The temperature is controlled. Uh, everything is controlled. The sound I'm sure is very good, uh, but it's lifeless. To me, it's lifeless. There is nothing to, to inspire it. Oh, look at this corridor. Yes, the children outside are still children, are alive. But look at this, uh, look at this space, you know, and I, I, I can, I can uh, choose and you can choose, uh, you know, millions of, of, of images like this from today's architecture. Truly, it's the whole world is filled with them everywhere. We call it maybe mainstream architecture to an extent, not the most 
you know, adventurous kind, but uh, uh, mainstream, you know, it's, uh, I, I don't like it at all. It, it, to me, it's frigid. And look at this, you know, uh, the society of consumption. I don't know what this man is doing here, some kind of um, lab man, you know, what are these shelves? It's, it's, it's all about control, the control of Anthropocene, the control of the, the age of the man, of the humankind, that we control everything through the mechanisms of anticipation, through all kinds of uh, gadgets that we have. But, but that vital impulse, the, 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 the power of life, the organicity of life is missing. And look at this. I think it's in Stuttgart, the library. God, I, I, I wouldn't like to go there and pick up a book. I just wouldn't. I'm sure they have great books, but it's something I think almost frightening, you know, here. It's, I mean, if you compare it with, let's say, the library in Stockholm by uh, Gunnar Asplund, you know, there, there is a world that is uh, towards the outside the brick and inside uh, you see the books and the roundness and it's a very different building. And still rational, but this one is why is it so whitish? Why, 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 why so much white? Uh, or this, another image, in my opinion, of, 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 of structural frigidity. You know, even if it's a little bit curved, but essentially it's it's a it's a frigid uh, a frigid structure. Here we have the play with uh, with the curves. But still, uh, you know, it, in my opinion, it's not, um, you know, erotically charged uh, space at all. It, it, the shapes uh, suggest some kind of a spiraling, but uh, I wouldn't like love to be like this. No, no, life sh love should be red, not grayish, not white, not sleek. Uh, look at this. Now, you know. I look at the trees behind and on the right side and look at the house, you know, uh, sitting on the earth, not springing from the earth as um, Frank Lloyd Wright uh, asked from, uh, from a building to be, or this. And again, you can find such images uh, countless times. This, uh, you know, it's very surreal. It's it's uh, maybe in this sense it has it could have a certain interest, but uh, again, uh, that uh, contraceptive uh, pill that that uh, doctor uh, invented is actually uh, uh, could could serve as a metaphor for uh, the contraceptive pills that we take as architects when we do our projects, uh, and in order to avoid you know the to avoid the, the, the pain, the lack of control, um, the, the, you know, the, the possible consequences that could be dangerous. In essence, yes, it's about avoiding danger, but by avoiding, avoiding danger, we avoid life. Uh, even when we play with, uh, with, uh, with uh, shapes like this, you know, in, in essence, we are still avoiding life. This is my opinion. We are actually not risking anything. Yeah, these uh, curves can be very easily generated today with all kinds of sophisticated or not so sophisticated programs. But it's not, it's not really a risky activity. You know, we are just replacing the rectangular paradigm with a curved one, that's it. Or the here, we have all kinds of twisting. You know, Ingels also is a master of twisting. But in essence, even himself doesn't really take the ultimate risk. The risk of not taking a contraceptive pill, you know, of, of allowing nature to say, uh, wait a minute, I am supposed to have the upper hand, not you. So allow me to decide, okay, and you do what you have to do, but allow me, nature, to decide. Uh, now, in opposition, I have to show you, and I did show this um, once or twice in the past, I forgot with what occasion, the building that moved me the most from all the buildings I saw in my life. I didn't see really so many, there were, there were parts and there are parts of the world I didn't ever visited and important parts, but from all the buildings I saw, this temple in Pestum, 
which is a pre-Doric temple, moved me more than anything else. And I will try to explain why, and I will try to, um, uh, to, to situate it in opposition with what I just showed until now. So here in Pestum, when I arrived there, I just, I was, I was shocked almost by the immense power of those pre-Doric columns. Uh, this temple uh, moved a lot, Winkelmann, Goethe, Piranesi, and Kahn, and I'm sure many others, but I know of these four very important names in culture. Uh, why? I've, I've, I read that Pestum has such a, uh, uh, the, this temple, Hera's temple, there are actually two temples there, Hera one and Hera two. It's also called Neptune's temple. It's so vital uh, that, uh, that, that uh, an, uh, a couple that is not able to achieve fertility, if they spend the night in the proximity of the temple, they become fertile. It's perhaps a legend, but maybe there is a little bit of truth here. And I will try to explain if I can. Unfortunately, I took many pictures, but I took them with an analog camera. I have them somewhere, slides. I was proud of the pictures I took. I actually couldn't find pictures as moving. I'm not trying here to, you know, to emphasize my, uh, you know, skills as a photographer. I'm just trying to say that I couldn't find the pictures uh, that I would have liked to find um, uh, as evocative as those that I took, because I, I photographed also details. Uh, I, I was truly very, very moved by this temple, which is very, very, very heavy. I mean, you see here the the column is almost, you know, there is uh, is almost dwarfed at the top by the heaviness because this was a pre-Doric temple, so archaic. Maybe that's why Louis Kahn loved it. It was very, it is very earthy, a raw and vital, exactly what Zaha Hadid was looking for and didn't quite achieve. Uh, I am asking myself, after all, where does this magic come from? I think it comes from gravity. I mean, this is a building that truly acknowledges gravity uh, uh, in a very convincing way. It's, uh, uh, it's a very heavy architecture, but somehow, maybe paradoxically, for the spirit, it is uplifting. Uh, for me, it was. Uh, again, uh, the pictures here, I, I, I don't know. I was unable to find those, those, those immensely emotional pictures that I expected, but uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm trying my best with, with the pictures I have at my disposal. Khan mentioned this, that um, you know, the capital is, uh, is, uh, is, is, is squeezed, is, 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 you know, is, uh, you can tell that there is an immense weight on it and it's, it's almost, almost dwarfed and it's not, but ex exactly in the pain of the structure here, maybe resides some of the sources of the immense vitality of this structure. Um, there are just remnants now. It's not the whole temple alive now, but it, you know, it's enough. And it's enough not just for the spirit, I think for the whole body. Maybe that's why the legend that, uh, you know, an infertile um, couple, if they spend some time here, they become fertile. I felt that telluric, tellurical force. And that force I didn't feel in, in any modern building, although I love modern architecture. Uh, and I didn't feel it in, um, you know, in the library by Zaha at, um, uh, in Vienna. Uh, and I have seen a few other buildings like, uh, uh, I think it's by, because of the matter, you know, the, the, this materiality, this, it's earth, but it is earth that, is, this, that became geometry and became architecture. And it's very, very primal, it's very powerful. It's not the same. It doesn't matter how sophisticated our new materials. Uh, it's not the same. I, I think it has to do with this fact that despite the power of gravity, the building still springs upwards, but not in an arrogant way, because as I said, it, 
you know, the, 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 you feel here that the pain of the column is, 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 is but, but it's almost like, a, I, I know that someone who advocates hedonism would, uh, would not agree with me, you know, because uh, there is a suffering here. It's the suffering of the stone, the suffering of the, of, of the humans who built it, the suffering of the column. It, it, it is suffering, but it is suffering transcending. I think it's, it's exactly like that ode, ode to Joy by Beethoven. It essentially, it's a, it's a tragic music, but it, it, it culminates in joy, an earned joy, a powerful joy. That kind of joy is not the joy of fun. It's not the joy of entertainment. It's an existential, almost a cosmic joy. That kind of joy, I don't think we can, we can uh, and it's also the joy of that couple that gives birth to a baby without the contraceptive pill. Because that contraceptive, I mean, please don't try to misunderstand me. I know myself at the level of my own life, the problems that could arise from, um, you know, yes, the difficulties, you know, what do you do with two young people, you know, becoming parents when uh, they are supposed to be students and, uh, you know, there is no money, there is no house. That is, I mean, you know, it can be tough. But on the other hand, if you deprive life of those difficulties, what do you get? You get, yes, essentially we are avoiding life through these uh, so-called pills. And we are avoiding architecture through the so-called architectural pills that we take uh, in our common, uh, you know, so-called common practice. Uh, Maybe I have an anachronistic mentality that I see some value in, 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 in the relationship between, I, I know I discussed this with uh, Wolf Briggs when he entered Zoom on that day when it was his birthday, uh, when I asked him about, uh, about suffering and he was against it. He was against it. And he, he mentioned uh, Mozart, who he said he was a playboy and he had a lot of money at the beginning. What he didn't mention was, and I didn't mention it either, but I thought of it, was that Mozart composed the Requiem. The Requiem, I mean, you know, it's very easy to only concentrate on the light and the so-called beautiful, joyous, uh, superficially or not, uh, uh, joyous, um, you know, aspects of life, but gravity exists. Uh, by the way of Pestum, um, when uh, Wolf Riggs visited the school, uh, the university here, uh, I don't know, three years ago, <clears throat> I asked him, uh, because I read uh, in, uh, in South Korea, he was interviewed and, and he was asked, what five examples of the best architecture can you recommend to, I don't know, young architects, students, or whoever. And he said like this, the pyramids, the temple in Pestum, the one you are looking at now, uh, the uh, Guggenheim Museum in uh, Bilbao, uh, a, a plane, he mentioned a plane, yes, he thought was architecture. I think Boeing 747, uh, I forgot exactly the number, but a plane, and the fifth one, uh, the little church uh, for Martin Luther that he built uh, in the town where he was born. But I asked him when he visited the school, uh, what about Pestum? Because he always advocated a non-gravitational architecture. And he said, no, 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 I didn't say that. I never said that, but I saw this, I, 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 I read it. Uh, he, he did say it in that interview in South Korea that he, 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 he recommended this building, which he denied later for everyone, everybody to see. All in all, I mean, I, there is a man now who, who, who talks to you now, uh, uh, who saw this. I have been there and I know what I felt there. Uh, the, the power of that architecture is, was, is absolutely amazing. And um, if you, if the pandemic goes away and you are able to leave, uh, to, to travel again, if you arrive in the south of Italy, please do not forget to make take a two, two, uh, short trip. It's, it's uh, you know, in the south. Um, so uh, 
it's it's not hard to arrive there. And in fact, it's not too far away from Pompeii, so you can shoot two birds with one uh, bullet. Again, the the pictures do not truly really convey what I felt there, but the 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 power of this architecture is is uh, of the highest order. Now maybe it's also the prestige of time. It's the oldest building I, I saw. I never went to Egypt, or uh, I, but this is about 200, 500 years um, old. 2,500 years old. Um, you know the plan. These are technicalities. I'm talking uh, about the emotions I felt in the proximity of those uh, uh, those columns. Piranesi. This is Piranesi. You'll see some images of this very very earthy. I mean, again, if Zaha Hadid said that she was searching for a raw, R A W, vital, V I T A L, an earthy, E A R T H uh, Y architecture, here it is exactly that. All three terms are beautifully illustrated by Pestum. I'm not saying it's the only architecture in the world like this. I'm sure there are other examples, um, but this one for me because also is 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 not part of a city is not part of a town is in nature and it's something magical and it's it's the greek culture but in italy and um, i mean did you look at the circumference of one column i mean compared to the height of a human being these are very they are giant columns and you wonder who built this and why well you know, it was certainly for, uh, uh, you know, serving uh, faith. Something like this we don't do. I mean, again, you know, it's about making love without a contraceptive pill or with. This is the difference. Here is without. You know, it is it's it is what it is. It's uh, okay. It could be dangerous. Yes, uh, we could encounter problems, but something vital happens. And that vitality, we do not. See, I do not see too much, in, even in the most, uh, you know, uh, convoluted and uh, twisted and interesting architecture. Somewhere you can tell that the contraceptive pill was taken. This is what I feel, even with uh, the most uh, notorious uh, so-called adventurous architecture today. You feel that the architects uh, took that pill invented by the Austrian uh, uh, doctor. I, of course, I'm saying it metaphorically. So what is fertility in architecture? I think a great architect is fertile. Yes, it, it, it generates life, it sustains life, and it doesn't mimic life. And I think many of our buildings mimic life. Uh, not all of them. And some of them during construction do not really mimic life. Uh, that, that, that impression uh, comes upon me mainly after the building was built. Piranesi Apestum is where Suono dell'Architectura, I don't know what Suono means. Uh, uh, I, I plan to search for the <laughs> translation, um, but uh, it doesn't matter. I mean, it does matter, but. Uh, you know these 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 uh, etchings by uh, by uh, by Piranesi are uh, are unbelievable. And I actually had myself one, an original one. And uh, when I had nothing to eat, I had to sell it. And now I I, I regret. But uh, that's that's what it is. You know, uh, <laughs> even though I say that I eat in order to live, uh, sometimes you know we have to live in order to eat because uh, otherwise. Um, Anyway, what is also beautiful here is you see the, the conjunction between the manifestation of nature and architecture. You see plants, vegetation attacking, attacking the, the, the structure, and uh, <laughs> the structure still persists, but there is a struggle there. Um, these etchings are beautiful. I mean, he did a whole series, Piranesi, called Pestum, together with his son Francesco. Uh, and he, I think he carved himself of around 15 or so, and his son a few more um, because he died. Uh, by the way, uh, last year there were 300 years since Piranesi's birth. 
He was born in 1720. It's amazing, you know, where this man didn't build significantly, but through his etchings, he, he achieved great power and architects as diverse as, in fact, both Wolf Briggs and uh, Rem Kolhas mentioned Piranesi as being uh, one of the um, uh, mentors. Um, he, he is, and, and the fact that Pestum is so moving is uh, shown clearly by the fact that this man dedicated a whole series. Uh, I forgot exactly the number, around 20, 17, 22, I don't know, around there. But these are large uh, plates and, uh, you know, uh, the power of architecture is, and the fertility of architecture is there so powerful and so powerfully represented by this uh, etcher of, of genius. Because yes, architecture has to have this, it's almost like the suffering of the earth manifested geometrically and structurally through, through the working of man, through stone, through a stone above another stone. And, I don't know, it's something, it's something magical. It really is a pesto. So I don't know, I mean, I'm not very precise. I'm uh, I, I, in, my, uh, in my descriptions. I am only trying to convey uh, uh, the possibility of an architecture that is indeed like the one Zaha Hadid professed she was interested in, meaning raw, meaning uh, vital, and meaning earthy. Uh, and how can we do this today? This is the question, because it's not easy. She didn't quite achieve it. Uh, she was moving maybe in that direction, but unfortunately she died. Uh, maybe if she would have lived 20 more years, uh, we would have seen something moving in, 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 in towards, towards this, but... Um, uh, she didn't. Maybe Patrick Schumacher will do it by himself with his office, their office. Um, anyway, um, so what we see here is, I, I, I'm not sure I, I can express uh, uh, very adequately what I want to express. In a way, all architecture tries to fly, tries to, 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 to you know, to annihilate um, you know, the bringing down that, that gravity exercises on us. But I think there are several ways to do this. I remember Brunku saying that he, he didn't want to, he, when he did uh, his uh, series of birds in flight, he was also interested in flying, but not like a plane. I mean, this is, it almost amazes me, actually, the fact that uh, Wolf Rix, who loves Brinkush, uh, um, didn't, uh, it seems he didn't reflect on the difference between a, a, a building that wants to fly metaphorically and not uh, physically. Uh, that's why, I mean, a building, a plane is not a building. I think a plane, a, a, a building like a cathedral flies metaphorically, it doesn't have wings, it doesn't fly physically, concretely, explicitly, it flies, you know, in between quotation marks, it flies metaphorically, while also assuming the gravity of the force of gravity. And it's this conjunction, that's why somehow, I mean, I don't know, I, I'm improvising now, but I think it has to do with the relationship between joy you can read uh, flight and suffering. You can read pain. Uh, uh, I think there is a connection between the two in the best works. But I know that when I say this, I could be very well attacked by the one who says, come on, this is a bourgeois, uh, you know, uh, cliche. In fact, I use these words myself in, in, uh, in my dialogue with him that the artist has to suffer in order to achieve creativity. But I know things are not so simple, but, but I think there is a difference between fun and joy, real joy, joy, that joy of the old of joy by, by Beethoven. Uh, fun is mimicking joy, uh, you know, in, in a way fun relates to game and joy relates to play. Is a difference even linguistically uh, underlined by Johann Hösinko in Homo Ludens. 
uh, I'm not against, I mean, that you, you could have great art that is uh, lighthearted. Yes, it's possible, but it's not, I don't know what to say. It's not, it's not, it's not superficial. I think there is a difference between being lighthearted and being uh, frivolous. Uh, anyway, I am on a dangerous ground now here. I understand. It's also I'm subjective. You know, I like uh, maybe I even like suffering to an extent. I, I like a certain kind of art that is not, uh, um, you know, uh, I don't know. It's it's earned. It's earned. Maybe it's through through struggles. Now here are the hands of the etcher. Now the, the, the etcher, I mean, this was uh, painted uh, probably after his death. Uh, I see a certain, a certain um, I don't know, aesthetics here that, uh, but I don't know, it doesn't matter. I just thought of showing a, a portrait of Piranesi. Uh, and uh, here is how he depicted himself. He has this questioning uh, face and, uh, uh, there is the stone at the bottom, you see, Battista Piranesi, Veneto, Venet, Venetian Veneti Architectus. Um, I, I wonder why he depicted himself without a shirt. That, that could be a, some kind of a question. But his inquisitive uh, expression makes me think a little bit of uh, Baudelaire. He does look a little bit like Baudelaire. And Baudelaire, uh, this year, there are 200 years since the birth of Charles Baudelaire and also 200 years since the birth of Dostoevsky. My God, my God, two of my heroes. Back to Piranesi, back to heaviness, back to gravity, back to suf the suffering of the stone. That suffering of the stone that I do not see today in, uh, in our architecture. Now you could say I'm anachronistic. Uh, there is greatness in the absence of the stone. There is greatness in the absence of gravity. Uh, maybe, but what I felt in the proximity of this temple, I didn't feel anywhere. And more than this, as I said, <laughs> there, is, there are such stories that uh, couples that have problems to conceive, they spend a little bit of time in the proximity of this temple and they become fertile. I don't think this will happen with any modern building. And I love modernity, but I never heard of such a legend, you know, to spend the night near, let's say, La Tourette or uh, falling water or whatever, and you become fertile. Now, here is the power of the earth. I don't know if, if myself I am quite aware of what I'm saying. The power of the earth, that mysterious, dark, heavy force that we are born from the earth and we return to the earth when we die. And what is the earth, actually? Do we know? I don't, and I don't know if, uh, if, in general, if we know. This is a very powerful architecture, and too bad that the color, the light is not like this, it's a little bit reddish. Uh, that's how I saw it at, uh, at, uh, when the sun was setting. Uh, it's, it's, it, the, the, I couldn't find the, the, the pictures I, I was looking for. I hope, I, I mean, I have somewhere those slides in an attic in, uh, in a town in Transylvania, in Sibiu. You see here, you see a little bit better, this kind of brownish, reddish. Uh, this is Hera 1 and this is Hera 2. Uh, here there is an unbelievable power. Uh, and uh, anyway. I mean, I understand we cannot build the whole world with, <laughs> with giant stones, but maybe we could build again for those mysterious forces that the ancients called the gods. Maybe here is the modern day tourist. I don't know why she's so, why she's so happy. I mean, I just came across this picture and that amused me in a way, you know. Uh, uh, what can you do? Maybe there, yes, there are joys in our life as well. I mean, until the pandemic arrived, you know, we, we visit, we are tourists. But just think of it, this building is 2005, approximately 2,500 years old. Uh, how many of our buildings will achieve this age? <laughs> I don't think too many. Far from it. Anyway, uh, the grass. And now we, we soon will uh, we'll come to the second step of this presentation.
that relates in a way to what I'm going to say. The grass is very fragile now. It's, 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 it's almost a paradigm of vulnerability. And somehow I'm thinking that that stone, that heavy stone of Pestum, is in love with this grass. And the grass is also in love with that heavy stone. I, I think there is a love affair between, uh, <laughs> here is the, the amusing tourist. Uh, I really don't know why she's so happy. Who knows? Maybe the photographer was a very charming uh, uh, you know, person. Anyway. Uh, yeah, pestum, heaviness, uh, and uh, the, the, I call it architecture without uh, peels. This is an architecture without peels, unafraid of uh, allowing nature and life to, to decide, so to speak. Yes, architecture without, without peels, or to use the words of Rem Kolkas, without the paraphernalia of protection or, or of protections, although he. <laughs> He used that paraphernalia himself because, yes, he's a modern man, just like me and you and all of us. Anyway, look at these stones, architecture without peels. The tectonics, I mean, this is the sumum of tectonics, no? It's, uh, and this is when architecture, I think, achieves its uh, ultimate uh, power and, and, and force. But um, power and splendor. Then, uh, yes. Re regarding that uh, Greek temple, uh, there was one explanation that I'd heard in Australia uh, in a history class. And that sir had told us that uh, uh, these people were afraid of the gods. So, so uh, they build all these heavy columns and place them inside the building. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, uh, that contradicts uh, uh, the uh, the, uh, the thing that it's uh, without fear. Did I say that it's uh, without fear? <laughs> I just talked about suffering, didn't I? I never said it without fear, or it, it is it is conquered fear. Uh, right. it, it's a big difference. It's uh, uh, like Picasso said. La tax est une fuite en avant. Uh, in other words, when you attack, you attack not because, you, in fact, you attempt. You instead of running away, you run. You run towards the one that provokes your running away. In other words, it's a conquered fear. The fear exists, and in fact, that is courage. True courage is not the absence of fear, but the conquering of the fear. And so, in in that sense, I said joy. Is is not uh, the absence of suffering. Is the is the is the conquering of suffering. But let's talk about Ishigami a little bit because somehow I felt uh, it would be appropriate. The Ishigami, as you know, for a good time. Uh, I mean, he's still young, but he he advocated almost the dissolution of architecture, the thinning thinning of architecture. Um, almost uh, at uh, unbelievable levels. Uh, I mean, look, it's not only that he's white, but he's extremely thin. And uh, you know the story that uh, the Venice Biennial, he, you know, he built something that was not seen and felt even by a cat, which actually ruined it by touching with its uh, tail. And uh, just before the Venice Biennial opened, uh, what he built and was almost impossible to see, uh, the cat ruined because even the cat was fooled. So, you know, it's the opposite of, of the Pestum Temple. It's, you know, the thinner, the better, the whiter, the better, the lighter, the better. Yes, now you see some furniture that is actually heavier than the structure that sustains the building because the, the users of the space needed um, in a way to balance the, the, the whiteness and the lack of heaviness uh, and the thinness with something more uh, fleshy, so to speak. Uh, this is the famous, uh, you know, uh, I don't know how it is called, uh, technological pavilion, I forgot its name, but uh, uh, it, it is a, an important building by him, but which tries to dilute 
architecture. In other words, to move in the opposite direction of what we saw uh, at Pesto. And here, uh, you, although, although it's not truly, really, and this is one of the paradoxes of Ishigami, I think, this is not architecture with pills because he takes some risks here. It's, um, uh, first of all, there is chains. I mean, he places these columns uh, at random. You know, there is no control. It's truly, uh, you know, uh, a chains game in a way. And um, uh, so, so he flirts with danger, although this danger is, as I, as I said, uh, served or serving uh, whiteness, lightness, and thinness. Uh, look at the trees on the left. Uh, they are, I mean, in a way, this is an interesting picture because on the left we see nature, on the right we see man, and um, but we see men of the 20th or late 20th, for, uh, the beginning of the 21st century. Not any man, I, I wouldn't say any man, but we are we arrived here really. Uh, where at the peak of our control, of our ability to control our lives and take our destiny, you know, in our hands and, and so on and so forth, we seem to be uh, visited, I think, by some ang anguish. Because uh, what do you do when you deprive life of all the, you know, yes, the suffering as well, yes, that's all the fear as well. But, uh, by the way, of fear, the, the important Romanian philosopher Emil Choran said, when in ancient times, when man was the slave of the gods, uh, he was, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, fearful, if you want, but, uh, but highly creative. We are free, but highly sterile. We are sterile. This is what uh, Choran felt. And I would say to a degree, he was right. Um, because how else to explain the very powerful emotion I had near that building, which I didn't have near, you know, the, some of the most splendid uh, modern or contemporary buildings. Why is it so? It, it, at the Venice Biennial, you see Shigami again, uh, dialectically confronting nature in a way, uh, but, but he dilutes the structure of man uh, a lot, uh, a lot of transparency, again, uh, very, very, very thin uh, uh, structural uh, elements. Uh, he, he made them as thin as possible. Uh, and um, although you will see not much later in this presentation, another work by him, where, by him which somehow seems to connect with Pestum or wants to connect with Pestum. I don't know if he thought of Pestum, but uh, uh, you will understand why when we arrive very soon there. Even here, look, you have this, um, you know, a slate uh, this on, on, on the roof, but, but the roof is supported by what? You know, the very opposite of the columns at Pesto. You know, they are just, uh, this is a strange, uh, um, you know, uh, gallery here, a, a pavilion he built. I, I, uh, I have certain intuitions, but I'm not sure I can verbalize uh, properly now. But even here is some kind of a reversal, you know, it's the columns are almost, uh, you know, ridiculous and uh, using a very different architectural language. In fact, no architectural language at all. They are just, you know, uh, minimal uh, vertical uh, things that support this uh, rather informal and primitive uh, heavy roof. Here is the man, he doesn't seem to be too happy. <laughs> and although he's dressed with a, with a tie and so on, he doesn't seem to me, he's an interesting man and I'm curious uh, how he evolves, um, but he doesn't look like a happy man. I, I, I have a feeling he knows. I have, I have the feeling that he knows uh, he's aware of, of, of the things that don't go well in our world. Here too, <laughs> you know, he's, he's, he doesn't look like a happy man. Uh, maybe one day I'll have the occasion to talk with him, I don't know. Anyway, it's not so important. But what do you see here? Almost nothing, right? It's, it's the, the dark brownness, 
with a little bit of a light uh, coming from the right side of the screen. Well, you understand soon what it is. It's, it's the anticipation of, uh, of, uh, of something that in a certain way, only in a certain way and somehow in a paradoxical way and in, even in a perverse way connects with pesto. Look at this, this is also Ishigami. But it, this is also, although it is a genuine uh, longing for that rawness, vitality and earthiness that uh, Zaha was aspiring towards without really arriving there. But even here it's some kind of a um, reversal and uh, you probably know why. Because he arrived at this uh, uh, in, in a kind of upside down way. Uh, you know, he poured concrete and then he removed and whatever is like the negative in a way. What we see here, what we used to, what used to be the, the almost the sumum of positiveness and, and uh, I, I don't know how to express in, in, in the work, in his work is, is the opposite, is, 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 is a negative. And uh, um, it's, it's kind of, I mean, the effect is interesting but on two levels is not quite satisfying uh, because I feel even here is some kind of a, I don't know how to say it. I, I, I'm, maybe even, yeah, even here is an architecture with peels. Although the appearance is that there, there are no peels, but uh, yes, the plan, but yes, the plan, but, but the functions that he serves with this cave-like uh, uh, thing uh, are also problematic. And they are also related to the to the invention of the Austrian uh, Austrian doctor. You know, I, I I like though. I mean, there is something inciting and uh, and provocative here. I mean, look at this equipment. You know, used by the engineers, the builders to build something which, in essence, would have been or should have been uh, the work of nature. Uh, okay, you know. Um, but it's built with a, you know, with a lot of technological sophistication. But I like this image very much. This is made by man, but it appears that it is uh, made by nature. It's by, uh, I don't know, worms eating up those, I, he has an expression, uh, he describes how, how, what he intended to do. You see, he, he wanted to free architecture, but paradoxically, he wants to free architecture exactly uh, moving in the direction of that, which, for example, Wolf Briggs and many others try to escape from. So it, it, this is the paradox. It seems that what would free architecture would be exactly what enslaved us, us to begin with at the very beginning, meaning uh, at the beginning of time. And that's not by accident, it's not by accident that uh, we have the cave revival these days. So, <laughs> you know, the relationship Leonardo da Vinci was totally right when he said pain and pleasure are twins. So what we try to move away from might be exactly that which could make us free again. Uh, now you could say, wait a minute, are you trying to suggest that by bringing back the gods will achieve freedom again? Maybe not freedom, but maybe that creativity that Emil Choran was referring to when he said the first human beings, those ancient people, were enslaved by the gods, but highly creative. That kind of uh, high creativity, I mean, viscerally high, uh, I don't see it too often uh, these days, uh, not at all. Ishigami in a paradoxical way, moving towards the extreme or the ultimate lightness, approaches somehow uh, through a strange play of uh, oppositions, uh, something of, uh, of what is a test of, but, you know, uh, dichotomically opposed. Although, as I said, he is trying to bring uh, earth uh, and also the, 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 the Chains, uh, uh, the, the chains manifestation of uh, earthy structures in other way, in other words, devoid, devoided of, of, of the will of man. Although he, 
that's why I said it's a little perverse that he obtained this image, but still by by uh, by uh, by forcing the hand in a way of of life or, or destiny or uh, because you saw it, it's the negative, uh, the positive was removed and he got this apparently by chance, but it's it's not really by chance. Anyway, it is interesting, too bad is flat at the top, I mean, totally flat. Uh, also, you would say, what is this thing for? And this is another legitimate question. Well, it is to be a foza, uh, restaurant and a bar, because, because what else could it be in our time, right? We have to eat and drink. Uh, and uh, and uh, here is the architect, you know, kind of uh, elegant. I mean, he's uh, up on something there. He's not quite on the floor, maybe to appear taller. Uh, but this is his studio. And I, I met a student from the University of Kiev who worked with him for a few months in Tokyo. Of course, he was not paid. Uh, but uh, he is an interesting man, Ishigami. And, uh, uh, what Ishigami does and what we don't do most of the time is, is questioning almost in radical ways the very beginning of architecture, the premise of architecture. You know, uh, so when Peter Eisenman said you have to start with a grid, well, obviously Ishigami didn't start with a grid in this project, not at all. So, um, you know, <laughs> Eisenman this time was wrong. Uh, but, but in the end, you see the flatness of the so-called cave. Uh, it's, it's flat, it's smooth, it's, uh, it's artificial. It's, and then what do we see? With these couples, uh, I don't know if they are using the pill uh, invented, discovered by the, uh, the Austrian uh, doctor, but they get drunk on the right. I mean, maybe they drink coconut juice, I don't know, and the other two are assuming the entrance into the labyrinth. All in all, the old story of life is the new story of life and is the eternal story of life. You know, we need love, we need, uh, we need eros, we need uh, vitality, we need, uh, yeah, to, to sometimes uh, have children, uh, we need to feel we are part of a continuum and uh, that life does not end with us. And even if we don't uh, decide ourselves, kind of life decides through us. It's, it's, it's how things are, you know? And uh, I, I only tried, and I'm not sure I, I was convincing and I, I chose the right words because it's a difficult subject. But uh, when you deprive Eros of its ultimate raison d'etre, that is procreation, uh, you play a trick on nature and uh, yeah, you arrive at a certain level of comfort, just as we arrive, arrive at a certain level of comfort in our architecture today, which is full of, of tricks. But um, I don't think the result in the end is uh, as moving as what we saw at Peston. But, but this being said, uh, there are people like Ishigami who keep questioning and investigating. And uh, I think there is uh, some suffering in him as well, freeing architecture. Uh, here he is uh, with long hair within the pavilion, or I forgot how it is called uh, on that campus uh, that he first built. He looks here like a, you know, a revolutionary, maybe from South America. I don't know why I thought of South America, I even thought of Che Guevara. But here we see the same man differently. First, his, the background is with trees, drawn, painted. I don't know what they are, wash, watercolor. So it's nature. Here, uh, uh, we see glass and we see the forest of columns that he imagined and built, very lightweight and thin and white. Uh, but, but there is the rebelliousness of nature in the man himself. Here, the man is uh, a little more, uh, you know, up to date, so to speak, in terms of appearance, but in, in the back is, uh, is, um, is, is nature, although it's nature uh, drawn in a certain way. 
and he does advocate, um, uh, you know, the being conscious, aware of nature, and trying to uh, activate its uh, its um, actuality in in, uh, in you know provocative, inspiring ways. Even in the work, apparently heavy work that that he did, it's about the same thing, mimicking at least some of the resource, resourcefulness of nature in, in, in surprising us. Now, I end this presentation with a building which maybe I, you saw before, is one of the buildings that uh, uh, sometimes, a few times I showed, is not yet an architecture without pills. It's not yet an architecture that uh, uh, um, totally eliminates the contraceptive uh, uh, pill that the, the Austrian architect uh, um, and the doctor invented, but I think it has a level of uh, earthiness and rawness and vitality, uh, which unfortunately he sabotaged a little bit through his uh, preoccupation with uh, precision. And you'll understand what I'm talking about. This is the building. This is a building which is not glamorous, is not built for the elite in Miami, or who knows where that Za architect with 450 people built. This is a building that is, um, you know, for the uh, so-called uh, the men on the street, you know, people like me and you, uh, if you allow me to include you in this group. Uh, uh, <clears throat> it's a building that uh, assumes the spiral, but it also assumes a level of viscerality. It's not white and it's not sleek. The spiral apartment house in Ramat Gan in Israel from 1984. Tzvi Hecker was, uh, is, is still alive, a Polish architect. He left Poland just like Daniel Lipskin, but while Daniel Lipskin went to New York and bought a pair of uh, cowboy boots made of lizard uh, leather, Tzvi Hecker went to uh, Israel and uh, didn't buy a pair of uh, cowboy boots made of lizard. Uh, uh, leather. This is what he says about this building, and then we'll see more, more drawings and more images of the building. It is a work of incomplete precision because it is so precise, it can't be really finished. No limit to the protection, to, to the precision one can achieve. The spiral's incompleteness is also its poetry because poetry is the most precise expression of our need for precision interesting uh, thought about poetry. Expressive as, it is, expressive as it is, the spiral can be fully understood. It speaks to many languages at one and at the same time. It speaks Arabic about the human condition. It argues in Hebrew about the sheer necessity to bring the muscles and materials together. But it is quite fluent in Russian when construction becomes architecture. Its Italian is very Baroque, as spoken in Piemonte by Guarino Guarini. The spiral is a tower of Babel in miniature. And uh, there are some pills involved here, unfortunately, but the, 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 I think the, the aspiration was correct. Unfortunately, there are mimicking things here. What can we do? He's a man of, uh, of our time, uh, 1984. I don't know, I'm not so convinced about that excessive underlining of the precision. I did hear, maybe I actually am tempted to think that that, uh, um, you know, ostent ostentatious search for precision is actually one of the limits uh, or deficiencies of what he did. Not that I'm against precision, but not uh, an exacerbated precision. Because we, we, uh, even if you do not complete the, the obsessional work towards precision, uh, the, the obsession uh, could be bothering. Nevertheless, the building is interesting. It is uh, uh, tormented to the necessary extent. Uh, it, it has elements of uh, some kind of uh, anxious uh, fluidity. Uh, the spiral, of course, is conducive, but as opposite to many of the works that are done today, it has this, um, I would call it, uh, uh, th there is a level of suffering. Sorry, I, 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 
I come back to this world and I hope Vatsal hears it because between suffering and fear is not a long distance. Um, Dan, uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, 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 do you see what I see in the plan? Uh, uh, the building is geometric and these spirals have been inserted. Uh, the, uh, if you go back a slide or two, uh, yeah, the, there is geometry. This is the geometry. And then he's in, inserted the spiral stairs in this. First, the building is conceived and then those spirals are added. That's what I see in the plan. I'm not sure I understood, but uh... Uh, the jump, the fan shaped building is conceived first with all those levels going down in a fan shape. And then he's inserted these spiral staircases. You can right. see it in this picture, the fan shaped building with levels going down, uh, uh, the building uh, descending. Yeah. Here. yeah the... we, we, we don't know which one come, came first, uh, but it doesn't really matter. If maybe it was, as you said, maybe not. Uh, the, the thing is we have almost a clash between two systems. And that's why I, 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 I refer to the word uh, suffering because there is, this is not an easy, you can tell he struggled and you'll see now the drawings a lot of drawing, lots of drawings that went into this. If the man truly wanted to make a micro bubble, Tower of Babel, I don't know if he succeeded, but it seems he he wanted to do something like this. It's not, a, I, I wouldn't call it, you know, the, the ultimate building of our time, no. But I think he assumed certain levels of difficulty like here, for example, uh, mentioned in Piranesi. Well, this is almost the culture by Piranesi, but the drawing was done. I don't know if uh, Tzvi Hacker thought of Piranesi when he did his drawing. Um, but here we see clearly, you know, uh, vi the violence of, uh, of an Eros without pills. That's what we see. In fact, if you, if you would have remained uh, um, loyal to this impulse, I think you would have done a building even more convincing. But unfortunately, yes, and we know these difficulties. We have to go through geometry. We have to go through using materials of our time. We cannot go to those big giant stones that uh, the builders of the temple of Hera uh, used. But uh, look at the drawings that he, he, you'll see now a number of his studies. Um, I think uh, but Sal did touch upon something that there are here two systems at work, and and uh, and uh, you know the spiral and the fan-like shape that uh, Vatsal mentioned, and it's hard to it's very hard to to negotiate between the two, and uh, maybe some of the difficulties that he assumed derive exactly from this, uh, maybe the, the incompleteness itself that that he mentioned. Um, maybe he was too ambitious. Sometimes, you know, the true art is to know when to stop. Sometimes, uh, you, I mean, yeah, it's very useful to know when to stop. Maybe that's where the art is. And it's not easy to know, <laughs> but I know this very well. I myself have a hard time to, to know when to stop, uh, including in my presentations. Anyway, um, I thought of showing this building is not, in my opinion, this still, this still is an architecture with pills, with contraceptive pills, but maybe a little bit less than uh, those that I showed at the very first, at the very beginning. Because he, assume, he assumes here the, the beast of nature. Uh, yes, he uses geometry, but uh, you can tell the man is tormented. He's tormented because he, he is uh, stirring up uh, tonic forces, maybe not as uh, frightening and powerful as those uh, uh, in Pestum, but uh, still he's, uh, he's uh, you know, endangered here. And, you know, the, the buildings show something of that, you know, they, the, the level of tectonics is a little higher, not sufficiently high, and you'll understand with the last two images, we are approaching the end now, uh, but and, you'll understand. Yeah, because then the previous slide, the building itself looks like a huge uh, spiral stair. Uh, yeah, 
you can see the spiral well, you don't, stairs. Uh, I'm sorry, Bazar, you don't have to tell us this. It's obvious. Right. <laughs> yes, it is. It's obvious. Yes, of course. That's why he calls it even the spiral building. But the, that so-called stair is not a stair. They are just steps, but nobody walks on them because they are the, around two meters and a half high. So, <laughs> you know, it's uh, maybe no, for some it, giant god or something. But what like, bothers me here, yeah. if you see the thinness, you would say that this is made of, you know, stones or uh, some material kind of like in pestum. No, it's just a, a fascia. It's just uh, applied, you know, and it's, it said, look here, you know, this is just mimicking. I mean, it becomes decoration. It still has a good effect to an extent, but to another, from another point of view, it's unsatisfying because it, it, it is applied work. It's not, uh, uh, you know, it, it doesn't have a sufficient level of necessity as, as it was the case uh, in, in Pestum. But, but what can we do here? We build for, uh, you know, uh, the men on the street and uh, those people uh, 2,500 years ago, they built for the gods. And the gods didn't need the, the invention of the Austrian doctor. <laughs> Nor did the, maybe they did, but they, the poor them, they didn't have the chance to have the great discovery being discovered. I'm talking about the builders of Pesto. So you see here, it's just applied, uh, mimicking a level of viscerality, which actually is not quite there. And it is uh, said, I would rather prefer what's here where <laughs> You see remnants from, uh, you know, maybe they fell from here probably or something. Anyway, even so, I think the, the, the building is uh, interesting, but very disappointing inside. I mean, the, the only thing that is not disappointing here are the flowers, the beautiful flowers. But unfortunately, look here, you know, it's, it's just uh, theater, it's stage design. It's, this is what we don't have in Pestum. In Pestum, there is no stage design. Here is stage design. In a way, it shows the, you know, that's why I said it's still an architecture with pills, using pills, unfortunately. And uh, the result cannot be highly uplifting. Uh, what can we do? What can we do? This is the time we live in. And yes, we have here the Dionysian approximately explosion of, uh, you know, planes and uh, blackness and whiteness. But essentially, you know, uh, the living room, uh, fortunately there are some references to the Arab world and uh, culture. And I think these are very fortunate that you have the, you know, uh, this kind of seating area, but, uh, <laughs> Otherwise, you know, we go back to the same thing, you know, the whitish uh, room with a sleek uh, flooring. Uh, yes, there is a rug and I'm happy there is a rug. And yes, there are pillows, although the pillows are a little bit too modernistic. Whatever, whoever lives here, essentially it's a modernistic space that, that uh, probably somewhere in a drawer here, there are also the contraceptive pills. You know, because uh, we also need aspirins, not only God. And uh, of course, <laughs> the modern kitchen, right? Uh, with, uh, you know, the ubiquitous uh, uh, assortment of uh, gadgets and, uh, you know, uh, very, very useful equipment and then uh, certain oils and uh, yeah, other ingredients and uh, <laughs> the smell goes away because we can control uh, that as well. So we are, we are, we are, we are enjoying ourselves on that, but we don't build pests too many longer. Thank you. That was an attempt to address a difficult subject. Very difficult.